Hey folks, welcome aboard 6823 Eastern on Tuesday. We're going to just jump on here a little bit, uh, uh, finish up the question and answer session I was doing earlier today. That was not live, so if any of you all have some questions, uh, I did a good uh, podcast, which I posted on the uh, YouTube channel. I haven't posted on the podcast with Mark Kohler. Uh, what's up, uh, Jeff? Jeff Rains, my man. Man, what's going on? Tell me about my bench press and go see a doc. <laughs> Jeez Louise, man. I'm going to have to. But first, I got to get something. I have to get my uh, an operation on my nose because I snore like a crazy man. And so uh, I'm going to get a sleep study so I don't... Uh, J J.D. Thompson, Mike Carpenter, right on, right on. And so I'm going there first. Uh, now that we have a real insurance through my wife's work, we're going to dawdle. Uh, we're going to go uh, get some, so maybe get my nose operated on some up in here someplace because uh, I won't wake my wife up at night. I remember being a snorer when I was, I don't know how people do in the army when you snore when you're out in the field because uh, wouldn't that wake up if you're snoring and you're Vietnam, wouldn't that wake up the Vietnamese? I, I never understood how... People sleep out in the field if they're snowing like a crazy man. But all right. Uh, so a couple of things. We did a question and answer. I was taking some questions on my uh, that I have received emails about. So I want to go uh, finish up some more of those. Uh, oh, yeah. Right on. Jeff's. OK, good, good, good. Yeah, man. So Jeff asked about the difference between admiral and investor shares. Uh, admiral shares it used to have to have one hundred thousand dollars in there. All right. Uh, now I think it's 10,000 or something like that. So basis usually about five to 10 basis points lower in expenses, Jeff, of the admiral shares and the investor shares. So you'd always want to default to the admiral shares if you can. And that's it. No other difference. Just the fees. And I think uh, a V Vince, I think the admiral shares, man, I don't even know if you can get them at other brokerage firms. Uh, I think you can. I, at one point you couldn't get them when I was at USA. Uh, and then at some point, I think you could. I, I just don't know. But I, I I know that of the two, you definitely want to get the uh, the Admiral shares for sure. Um, I want to share with you a couple of things before we get cracking here. I'm looking at uh, a comment. A guy had a uh, new student, <laughs> Dwayne, right on, man. Well, if you're a student and I'm a teacher, we're all in a world of hurt. That's for sure. All right. So uh, I commented on, uh, yeah, look, I'm not at all concerned about the inverted yield curve. Uh, my man, Graham Stephan, or Stephan, I don't even know how you say his last name. I like that guy quite a bit. I'm a fan of his uh, channel. Uh, he talked about that today. Uh, I think he did a video on that, which I think is a must watch because he showed you that uh, essentially it's a, it's a, it's a nothing burger. I just know the way around that. All these people are up in arms, you know, just, oh my goodness, you know, just, ah about a recessionary thing. And I just, I'll say it to a blue in the face, recessions happen. Uh, <laughs> AR-15, AR-10, present for duty in Michigan. Shh, don't you know that the first thing they're going to do is ban them, CD, CB, and then they're going to come for you, which is why I'll never accept a gun registration. They can try to say you need to register your firearms. I don't care. One of the reasons I left New Jersey, my understanding was you even had to register your shotgun in the sheriff's office. I lived in Camden County. Not going to happen. All right, so uh, oops, let me turn my email off here. Boink. All right. Uh, uh, so, Cheryl, uh, I, I heard you say no, but I just don't think you need bonds. I think if I can get two and a four, a two, a two point four and five, I think on a Vanguard Money Market account, Cheryl, uh, <laughs> heard that, that CB. Uh, if I get 2.4, 2.5 on a Vanguard Prime money market, and all I'm getting right now on the 10-year treasury, which is, I think, down to 2.4. Let's see. Yeah, the 10-year treasury is down to 2.41. That's See that TNX? That's 2.41. Uh, yeah, that means you're getting less on the 10-year treasury than you're getting on, a, uh, on the Vanguard money market fund. It's just no reason to do that. It's just none whatsoever. And then on a 30-year bond, I don't know what's that, probably a little bit less than three now. And that's the inverted yield curve. I mean, right there, you're getting less on money, mark, more on money markets than you are on uh, on on long bonds. So it doesn't make any sense to buy a long bond. And this not at 3% for 30 years or or 10-year at, uh, at 2.4. It doesn't make sense. Some guy... Uh, it's, <laughs> Some guy was arguing with me about uh, you can go in the market and buy high quality corporate investment grade bonds for a discount, and I just you, you can't. I just uh, I'm sitting there thinking I don't I don't I don't get this. So the issue is if you're going to buy a bond that's of any kind of credit quality whatsoever, you're just not getting any bang for your buck. You're just not, and so it's kind of like what's the point? And the facts are you're still paying ordinary income tax. Now if it's an IRA, it all comes out 
right now is OI ordinary income. So bond, why? I mean, if, I mean, look, if you have to have a bond, put it in your IRA because everything comes out as ordinary income tax anyway. But I'm just sitting there thinking, why would you do a bond for any significant stretch uh, when I can just have the money market at 2.45? And like I said, uh, someone that says GG says the best money market. And I would, uh, I mean, the Vanguard prime money market. I mean, there is something called break the buck now in uh, 2012. I forgot the name of the, the prime. I forgot the name of the firm, but they had a money market that went below a dollar. And I think that was the first time I don't know about in history, but a long, long time. And, uh, and the feds have now allowed that to happen, that a money market could go below a buck. So it's not 100% guaranteed. I get that. But if I, if I get 2.45 in a liquid account or 2.4 in a 10-year account, I'd take the liquid account. Now, I would also say I do like CDs, Cheryl. I'm a fan of laddering CDs without question. Uh, so you take your one year. Uh, to, so here's what I look at. You, it's, a, it's a barbell approach. Um uh, right here. So you take your, this literally, this is it. You got your CDs and cash, one year of cash, one year, two, uh, a one year certificate, a two year certificate. So you got three years of cash in this guy and then you got your stocks and that's it. I mean, it's literally, it's literally that simple. No need for bonds whatsoever. And then if you have bonds in a taxable account, why? Why do we have bonds in a taxable account? I mean, you're paying ordinary income tax. You're not, you're literally not making any money. So don't do that. Um, now people say, but they, and there is some legitimacy to this. The bonds can minimize some of the downside risks to a stock portfolio. Well, I mean, so can CDs. I mean, CDs can do the same. So I, that's just my opinion. I just, I don't, I wouldn't touch on the 10 foot pole. Uh, let's see here. All right. So we got uh, Ally 2.8 CD. Now what's the, what's the year on that? Uh, the term on that CB? Yeah, see annuity rates. Oh, Mike, you're asking me if I see annuity rates going down the same as treasury bonds. Annuity rates, um, maybe they don't change on a on. I mean, annuity they don't trade on the market. So the reason why you see that uh, this right here for the ten year treasury is because it trades daily. I mean, it trades all the time. And so annuities don't work like that. Annuities are set by insurance companies, and and what an insurance company does is they. And this is where um, where a lot of the times annuities are essentially, they're basically long-term government and intermediate government bonds uh, from pensions and, and insurance companies. They're the biggest bond buyers out there because of things like annuities, life insurance. And their portfolios can be stacked with you know intermediate long-term bonds. There's no reason for annuities to fluctuate at all. I mean, now they, they will on a gradual you know, decline, they absolutely could if we had an extended period of gradual decline, but there's no reason at all for annuity rates to fall off a brick like we're seeing right now. The treasury is just no reason whatsoever. Uh, Rexbo, right on, right on. I think CB and that you need to be friends. Yeah, exactly. Uh, same here, CB, right on. So a lot of, uh, uh, let's see. So remember, if we're being monitored by the NSA, they know who to go after when they ban your ARs. Um <laughs> Why do you need an assault rifle? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Kevin and checking in from Sunnyvale. I bought uh, John JD Thompson says I bought one hundred ninety five fifty dollar I bonds two thousand two thousand two to two thousand nine about a hundred bucks a month. They're averaging over three percent now. Yeah, as uh, I, I mean, if you got if you bought them, they're averaging over three percent. I would. I mean, you already got the money in there. I would have no problem with that. It's, are they I bonds too? You said so they're inflation. Yeah, I, no, that's that's a smoking deal. Uh, Clint Collins late again, man. Come on, bud. Uh, you're 11 probably. You're supposed to be on time. Unacceptable. Minimum investment for the Vanguard Prime Money Market account. Probably a thousand bucks, uh, Dwayne, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, my man, who uh, Martin, right on. Your analysts of preferred stocks had me thinking. I like preferreds, man. I tell you, I, look, don't go out there just listen to old Josh yapping here. But I'm, I, I think preferreds are the redhead stepchild. So, Cheryl, let's go back to your question. Why no bonds? I think the better alternative would be CDs on the barbell. But if I wanted to have something to kind of minimize my uh, volatility on the on the second part of this barbell, the stock side, um, I, I think preferred stocks look pretty good. So what a preferred stock is, is, uh, is, is a quasi bond, a quasi stock. And so a preferred stock would probably pay uh, six and a half, maybe six and three, eight, something like that. 
it's a dividend. It's taxes, qualified dividends. It's not an interest as ordinary income like a bond is. So it's much more preferable from a tax perspective for sure. So if I had to have an income generating account, I certainly want that in a taxable account without question or Roth because a Roth, again, we don't pay tax on that. But anyway, be it as it may, I'd want a qualified dividend in a taxable account. Preferred stocks are, they're, they're more, um, as long as the company pays even a penny on their dividend, the preferred stock gets paid at the complete, the coupon. So it's weird. They have a coupon attached to it, but it's not an interest bearing coupon that doesn't, it's not taxes, ordinary incomes, taxes, qualified dividends, but yeah, it's a coupon. So a lot of people in the business say coupon and will think that means it's a bond. It's not a bond. It's a, it's a dividend the way it's taxed. Anyway, long story short. With a preferred stock, as long as the company pays a dividend, the preferred shareholders get paid. They get paid first, thus the name preferred. They get paid first and foremost. So what you'll find is you'll find a company will just throw GE in out there is getting ready to cut the dividend. Everyone's panicked. As long as they pay a penny, the preferred stock owners will still get paid. And that's the nice thing about preferred stocks. I, I Even back in the... Uh, the 2007 and eight craziness with banks. And I had some prefers and I, man, I'm telling you the prices dropped like a brick and water is scary, but they still, I think every single bank, uh, cause most prefers are issued by financial institutions. And when I say most like 60 to 65%, but if memory serves, every single bank still paid. I mean, other than the ones that went bankrupt, but I think even Citigroup still had a one cent dividend. And the reason they kept that dividend is because they had to be obligated to pay the prefers. And it's a wonderful. So you have six point eight seven five on a on a qualified dividend that is preferred uh, in terms of the the restructuring organization, if you will, uh, to the the stockholders. So now you'll never get growth in there. I mean, it's just like any kind of bond in or fixed income investment is fixed. It's fixed at six point eight seven five. It's not reinvested, so you're not getting compounding interest. But man, as a way to get some decent yield without a huge tax hit, prefer stocks. I, I think they're fantastic. You know, look at ETF though, because the, the facts are, you, you can look at a preferred and it looks great, and you're just you don't know. I don't know. I mean, no, no one knows. So you get the ETF and I, PFF, I think is what it was. BFF, I, I did a video on it. It looks good. I think you're getting five to six percent yield. and had four or five hundred holdings in there. Don't quote me on this. I forgot off the top of my head, but man, that's pretty good. Now it does have volatility. I mean, it will fluctuate, not as much as a stock. Uh, the bank stocks did back in 2007 and eight, uh, the bank prefers did, but generally speaking, it will be less volatile than the stock market more so than the bonds. But man, I'm, I'm a big fan. Yep. I, uh, I like them. Um, uh, 14 months, 14 months CD at 2.8. There you go. Uh, 14 months CD at allied, at four, uh, allied bank at 2.8. That's a smoking deal, man. I'd, I'd be buying that up like crazy if I didn't have a tax bill. I don't like equity link CDs. Um, never a big fan of anything. That's that's called a structured product uh, CDG. I just I'm never a fan of structured products. Um, and the reason I'm not a fan of structured products because they always and I when I say always, I'm sure there's some guys like we don't always, but the ones I've seen have always they they don't account for dividends in the total. It's always point to point, or what's called price to price or point to point. And if you look at the total return of the equity market. To eliminate dividends, you're limiting forty uh, percent of the historical total returns, and that's what these uh, structured products do. They eliminate the returns uh, with the dividends. So inherently, it's just point to point or price to price. And I just you're going in with you know one hand behind your back. I just don't think to do that. There's there's always and always a, an exception to the rule, but I'm just I don't think it's worth it. Uh, CB in California has an AR and an AK, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> You're doing your duty for the country, my brother. Uh, Brian says only four thousand left on the house. I really want to pay it off fast, but didn't max out my Roth last year. Uh, man, put into the Roth, brother. <laughs> no, you'll have that sucker paid off within the year's time. Just put in the Roth. I know it's got to feel good. I, look, I'm so far away from the idea of paying that off. This thing right here is this monstrosity of my house, which I love, but man alive. My biggest expense by far is this sucker. Uh, I know you're going to want to pay it off, Brian. Man, just put in the Roth. It'll serve you better in the long run, presumably. Uh, credit Union says JD has a 25-month CD paying 3.03. Uh, yep, I would. <laughs> Ow, 
you get a two year CD, a two year uh, 25 month CD JD for uh, over 3%. Uh, NCUA insured, that's the equivalent of FDIC for the banks. I Man, I'd be moving on that like crazy. Literally, just remember, the worst thing that happens to CDs is you'll lose three or six months of interest. What to do? All right. I mean, so let's just say something bad happened to you and you need to ca- take out your cash. Well, as long as it's beyond the first three or six months that you drop the money in, you'll get all your money back at the worst case scenario. You just lose some money in CD and interest. Uh, that's a nice return alley. Uh, yeah, do what makes you sleep better. I agree. Do what uh, can I buy? Yeah, absolutely. Brian says, can I buy uh, Vanguard mutual funds out of my USA? Yeah, absolutely. That's, I have that without question. Yes, sir. Uh, just again, as I go back to USA, uh, they're selling everything. Uh, it's a uh, it's an S storm over there, it seems like. So I don't know what I, my, I still have my brokerage account at USA. I don't really pay much mind to it, but I still have that USA, Brian. And I, I know that uh, their mutual funds were sold to Victory Capital, whatever that is. And I know they're shopping uh, the rest of it, too. So at some point, you're going to want to move it for sure. I, I haven't moved mine yet. Uh, pay off the house. Yeah, but eh, I hear you, Martin. But to pay off the house, they only got 4000 in there. He's would you use the California mini bonds to pay down? Would you use California mini uh, municipal bonds to pay off your mortgage? Uh, I'm not sure what you're saying. Would I use it to pay off? Like to sell them to pay off a mortgage? You got it, Cheryl. Smashing right on. My man Bruce up in New York is smashing away. Have you ever heard of the GS Momentum Builder Multi Asset 55 ER Index? Good night. I, no, I haven't, Rexpo. Never heard of it. Uh, but the fact they, I guess, as Goldman Sachs for GS Momentum Builder Multi Asset 5 or the 55. I, I don't know anything about it. Um, by all means, common away. Uh, they're S- S- Synchrony Bank one year at 2.8%, 2K minimum. That's pretty good. If I do a Roth conversion, I can't touch the money for five years, correct? No, you can absolutely touch the money, uh, Franklin. So just remember, if you're over 59 and a half you, and you do the Roth conversion, you can absolutely touch the principal uh, because you already paid tax on it. Uh, you can't touch any gains, though, until it's been uh, five years to make it tax free, if that makes sense. So you can't touch the gains until it's been taxed, until you've had that for five years. But if you're over 59 and a half, you pay tax on it. You can touch the principal at any time. This is, this is literally like taking a distribution out of a traditional IRA. Uh, do you think the next move by the Fed will be a rate cut or an increase? I don't think they'll do anything. I, I hope not. I do want to talk about that. Actually, this is something real quick, and I'll get back to some of your questions. I had, a, uh, I guess, a nice little debate of some sort with a guy on my YouTube channel about the inverted yield curve and my thought on the silliness on the on – the, uh, the coming recession that the inverted yield curve purportedly shows. Uh, so this guy says, sure. When the rates are so high that the government, that the government is issuing 14% bonds, which they were doing back in the eighties and the early eighties, they have a lot of leeway to print a lot of money. Therefore expansion. That is the mechanism. That is the mechanism to pull out of a recession. Bonds are now in the 2% range uh, and we're through QE three and going into QE four which brings on negative interest rates and we're in a corner, but Hey, but no worries for you. Cause I'm a positive poly man. I just, Oh, for the love of me, man, I'm sitting there thinking what, <laughs> what in the early eight, in the early eighties, we were dealing with inflation that was through the roof, which is why Paul Volcker and Reagan got together and they had to kill it because they said, this cannot continue. We're getting to the stage of almost hyper, not Venezuelan or Zimbabwe, but hyperinflation. And so what do they do? They raise the rates like a crazy man in order to put a a negative on the economy. That's what they do. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you don't, (laughs) in an inflationary environment, you don't lower rates and then turn around and print a whole hell of a lot of money. doesn't make any sense. And the basic economics, just we got to know our basic economics. What caused the Great Depression? Everyone said the smooth Hawley tariff bill. It didn't. Is a retraction of the monetary supply. So monetary supply retracts. And what does that do? It causes the depression. Apparently, it just intuitively makes sense. Less money means there's not less growth. And in this case, on top of all the other stuff, it's going to be retraction of monetary supply. Now, FDR did a lot of damage to enhance their depression. Do you know? We had 25% unemployment in 1936, 
four years after FDR and his New Deal. So when people say he got us out of the Great Depression, absolutely not true. He actually heard it. There wasn't 25 percent unemployment until the New Deal and a lot of the stuff that uh, was getting approved now by Congress. Uh, but either way. All right. So there, we had a retracting monetary supply. What did that do to the economy? It made it go into a recession. Then the Depression, of course, government policy helped with that. And so this guy is sitting there thinking, when, the, when inflation is our bugaboo, we're going to print money to get out of inflation. It just doesn't make sense. I, I just, the base, lack of basic economics. So I want to share a couple of books with you. And this is from a man, Henry Hazlitt, The the Failure of the New economy, Economics, uh, Henry Hazlitt. And, uh, uh, and he talks about the analysis of the Keynesian fallacies, a wonderful, wonderful book to get. And you should, you should, you should, without question. But there's another one. I have it back here. So I guess so many books I can't find. I didn't find it. But it's uh, by a guy named Murray Rothbard, R-O-T-H-B-A-R-D, called America's Great Depression. And if you're interested in the economic theories behind this stuff and the true what happened here and what happened there, you got to read Henry Hazlitt. You got to read Murray Rothbard, uh, the history uh, of because you'll never learn this stuff. You certainly if you go to Boston University and learn economics uh, heavens forbid for the rest of America, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so Hazlitt and, and Rothbard, if you're interested in economics and not economics or an econometric position like Paul Samuelson and some of these guys are desperate, desperate to prove themselves so smart, um, which they were. I mean, don't get me wrong. They were a hell of a lot smarter than I was. That's why I never went that route. Because I said, this this isn't what I want to look at. Uh, Rothbard and Henry Hazlitt. If you're also, you know, if you're interested in just a basic economic theory, uh, if you read Henry Hazlitt's economic economics in one lesson, it's, I tell you, it's the best tutorial you'll ever read. You'll never read it in any economics class other than maybe at George Mason, uh, Grove City College, or UCLA. I, I hope UCLA is still uh, a bastion of free thought in their economics department. But other than that, I don't know what else there is. So George Mason, UCLA, and Grove City College up in PA. I mean, Hillsdale, I suppose, but I, I don't know if there's any, I mean, certainly not Boston University, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, just uh, just anyway, uh, at the end of the day, so read some of this stuff and learn how this worked, what happened in the past, because we can repeat these mistakes if we continue to make them. We don't deal with inflation <laughs> by printed money. It's nuts. And that's what this guy is arguing. So, ah, all right. So let's go down. Um, let's keep going. Uh, do you know anything? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if the same guy just asked me on the YouTube channel, but do I have an opinion on USA's media news? I love them. Big fan of them. I think, uh, people should do them without question. I sold them many USA, uh, media annuity when I was at USA. Always remember if you're doing an immediate annuity or you're doing a pension lump sum, not a lump sum, but a pension payout, get a joint and survivor life joint and survive. This is a married now. If you're married, joint and survivor life with a 20 year period certain joint and survivor life with a 20 year period certain. That simply means no matter what happens, I erased it. You know that either you or your estate will get paid at least what you put in with a little bit of interest. I hope that makes sense because it'll, if you, let's say Charlotte and I, we do a joint in life survivor annuity with period certain. What will happen is if I die, it'll still pay her until she dies. If she dies 40 years from now, it'll stop. If she dies 10 years from now and, and we have a, we have 10 years left on the 20 year period certain, it will pay our kids for another 10 years, if that makes sense. And I did a thing on the earlier YouTube today where I showed you that a hundred thousand dollar investment into a single premium immediate annuity, a SPIA, uh, let's just say it paid a five and a half percent of your payout rate. And so what happened is if if you guys died and it only paid for 20 years, you're really only getting a 0.96% uh, internal rate of return in IRR. You put 100,000 bucks in there, it basically it's going to pay back $110,000. That's nothing to write home about. But each and every increment of, say, five years, the interest, the IRR grows substantially. So if you survive 30 years, either you or your survivor, your spouse or your, it doesn't matter, just whoever the benef not the beneficiary, whoever the, the other annuitant is, uh, it goes from 0.96 to 2.4 to 3.0. And it even gets up and I can't remember if it quite hit 4%. I think it did. If you survive 40 years, it becomes a 4% IRR, internal rate of return. 
The reason for that is th these things called mortality credits. And that that's that's why a, a fixed uh, a fixed annuity, an immediate annuity is so valuable because the people who die early don't subsidize the insurance company. They subsidize the people who die late. And that's what makes it so valuable. So and that sounds bad, uh, but it's a mortality credit. So if you die early and you do not have the joint and life survivor annuity with a 20 year period certain all that money you put in just goes someplace. Well, it goes to pay off the people who survive well beyond their life expectancy. So I'm a huge fan of these things, man. And USA just happens to have some of the best, at least they did in the business. Again, USA is going through some changes. I think actually what they're doing is they're going to re uh, make their insurance side, reinvigorate on their insurance side. I think the bank is getting hammered across the board uh, compliance wise. They never had a good mortgage system, never had a good mortgage. I, th I think, I don't know if the restructure is about, I have no idea, but I think the bank has been a big, big problem for them. Uh, the investment side, they're, they're trying to just get rid of. We can see that a mile away. I mean, they say that. Uh, and so, but I think they're going their bread and butter, which is life and property and casualty casualty insurance and then you know life insurance a, a, an immediate annuity is a life insurance contract because it's insurance for life so i'm a huge fan of them um uh really so, uh, <laughs> cb says hit the like smash the likes uh what is a lending club yeah i'm, I'm not i've heard enough about it mjc uh i don't know anything to comment on it uh it's from marty right oh marty okay marty uh, my man, Tim, on the, the system here. Uh, Susan, how often these live stream happens? I'm new. Anyone can answer this. Thanks. Yeah, Bruce says once a week, kind of whenever I feel like it. I, I tried. Uh, yeah, I tried to do it once a week, and I initially thought I'd do it on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesdays were getting a little bit on the uh, – some reason where I can't remember why I was getting tough. So I said uh, sometimes I'll do it. I tried one on a Saturday afternoon. I might do that again. It's just kind of whenever I feel like it. I just – it's nothing fancy, Sue. I just – uh. I enjoy this actually because I like the interaction. It's fun. And now, will I do it every single day? No, I think I, you know, want to jump off a bridge uh, because you know I do wake up early, so I go to I do go to bed at night early. But at the end, of the day, I enjoy it without question. Got my cup of hot tea, and uh, it's fun. So I, I do them as uh, as much as I can. Uh, have a smashly good time. What what do I think of Paul? Yeah, it's funny. I've uh, uh, Paul Merriman, his name comes up a lot. I've never really followed the guy. I've had I probably about 10 years ago, someone uh, introduced me to his stuff and I enjoyed it. I liked it. Um, so I got a problem with Paul Merriman. I, I'm not that uh, of an expert on him, on him, except some of the people I respect like him. And if they res if they like him and I respect them, then inherently I like him, too. Um uh, by the way, it's raining out here in North Georgia. So uh, if, the, if we get a live feed that gets interrupted, I'll stay on board. Just FYI, you can stay on board, too, if you want. Or you can say I'm getting out of here. Uh, my man, J.D., I'm 55 and plan to retire from my IT management job at 32 years. Right on, man. Uh, about 25 percent of my money in Roth and the rest pre-tax trying to figure out when I should take the Social Security and pension. Yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, it's uh just gonna have to look at your 1040 for sure and say, hey, what I would do actually is I would get on the TurboTax, all right, and you can sign up for a free account and just start messing around. You know, say, hey, what if I took fifty thousand this year and I did not take Social Security uh, for my IRA? Um, at the, just I cannot stress enough that my see the the problem. Well, you say when should I take my pension? So it sounds like you have an option. I can't imagine they'll give it they'll la allow you to take it beyond sixty five. But, but the issue is once you have a pension, there's not a whole lot you can do from a Social Security perspective in terms of taxation because a pension is going to be ordinary income and immediately your provisional income will be so high that 85% of your Social Security benefit is going to be subject to income tax. There's just no getting around that. So if you could, uh, it's, so I mean, it's the, uh, it's the, it's, you know, it's, it's good to be rich in this regard. And when I say rich, I mean like, you know, monopoly rich. I just mean you know, Mr. Burns rich. I mean, but to have, three source of income, IRAs, pensions, and the social security. But if you do have a pension, I deal with a lot of military retirees when I was at USA and they have a nice pension uh, from a lot of time, like my grandpa, Lockheed Martin pension, uh, captain, the Navy pension, social security. Then he had his own savings stash away as well. So you know, he had four sources of income of which he had to pull. So he had to take social security. He had to take his pension, his two pensions. Then he had the RMDs on his IRAs. So there's not much he could do from an income tax perspective because he had these sources of income, which are mandated to pay uh, income tax on. 
But what he could do, and this is well, I mean, this, you know, my grandpa's long since passed, but what he could have done, and you might want to think about is if you're married, you say, okay, we might not be able to do much uh, from a tax perspective today while we are alive uh, as a married couple. But when one of us dies, it's going to get bad and it's going to get ugly. Um, and so, you you know, yes, you might need to bite the bullet a little bit more on the front end, J.D., uh, in order to let the, uh, the the better half not you know bite the bomb on the back end, if that makes sense. So you're looking at the difference between a you know, a 22 round and a friggin', you know, a 50 cal essentially. So I'd much rather have you take the 22 round on the front end than get hit by uh, those Vulcans on those A-10s. I don't know if any of y'all know what an A-10 was, but man, those things fire these huge, huge from a plane. Oh, scared the hell out of me. All right. Uh, hey, CB, a word of warning. I left an AR next to each other in my save. Nine months later, found a... <laughs> I see annuities. All right. Are there any annuities uh, written that actually track inflation? USA had one, Mike, and I, I was never a fan of it. Uh, USA had one that tracked inflation. Um, I don't even know if they still offer it. I don't think anyone bought it because it was such a low payment on the front end. Uh, <laughs> Rexpo, to clarify, uh, <laughs> uh, retiring three years, 55 now. I fit, okay. Good. So, JD, when you uh, when you hang it up, man, uh, before you start taking Social Security, before that pension starts coming in, I'd be freaking taking. I'd be pulling off that IRA like a crazy man. I'd be pulling off that IRA like you wouldn't believe, and I'd be paying the tax up front and just be done with it. Um, IRA slash four hundred one k. I bet he's going to seven or age seven. It depends on whether or not you need it earlier to live. Um, uh, Mimi Joy, uh, th thanks, Josh. That's what I'm looking at. Love your channel. Yeah. So, oh, I bet he's going to say at age 70, uh, Marty, you talking about for a JD to take his social security. Ideally. Yeah. You take it at age 70 for sure. Um, but I mean, it's just a lot going on there at the end, of, at the end of the day. Um, I'd be pulling for my IRA. The minute I hit the hang up, when I hang up my boots, I'm pulling for my IRA right then and right there. I'm paying the tax up front, being done with it, and then take Social Security at 70. That's I think that's a winning scenario. And I'm moving all the money I can to a Roth. Absolutely. Uh, go on Global Truth Project and read the present to see the truth about life and death, which can change the world from page one. Nothing's more important than reading it. Uh, can get pension between retirement date to 65 I imagine the longer you wait, presumably the more you get, but I don't know that to be true. A lot of times those pensions are based on the interest rates. And I think it was like the lower the interest rate, the more you got paid as a pension. I forgot. Uh, do you ever get to the free, go to the free investment? <laughs> uh, all right, wait. Oh, I missed one. Sorry. So CB says do a Roth conversion. I can't. Okay. Uh Uh, yeah, I'm missing that. Um, okay. Do I ever go to the free investment dinners and uh, mess with the speakers? Uh, in my younger years, I used to do those. I did two, man. And I hated them, hated them, hated them. And, uh, the, and I, and I will never go to one cause I know these guys, what they're trying to do. I mean, they're trying to earn money. They're trying to earn a business. I'd never be, you know, going out there, shoot at them for you know, <laughs> not shoot, not, YouTube algorithm. I mean, shoot in a negative way. I'm not saying anything. Uh, the algorithm's like, what, what? That guy said something. Uh, I'd never go out there to, to, you know, chop him off at the knees. Ah, oh, not with a real ax, YouTube. I'm just joking. It's Beth of the word. Um, these guys are trying to earn a live and I get it. I, I, uh, I got in a debate the other day. Who is it? Uh, I forgot who was. I was on some website. I forgot who was, but was, the guy was, uh, Talking up insurance products, and a lot of these insurance guys are going to do the, the the dinner thing. And I I just I forgot what it was. I think it was this morning, as a matter of fact. And I said, I just we're just debating. This guy's like saying that the index and new just the insurance products are going to outperform investment. Products. They're like I have no idea. I have no clue what's going to outperform. He's got no clue what, clue what's going to outperform. The thing that ticks me off though. This is what I told him. I said, the thing, the thing that you guys are, are missing, my insurance friend, is that I would say if you pulled 100 random people who got an annuity of some sort, be it an index annuity or a variable annuity, 
I would bet the vast majority of them, or at least the predominant amount, would think that they're getting an 8% guaranteed rate of return on the principal, i.e. the cash value, or what I call the walk away money. Or I bet I bet they, they don't understand the complexity of the product. No, I, don't want to say, I bet they don't understand what they're going to get. I bet they think, and this is a whole life too, I bet they think that they are going to get, say, 6% interest on their cash, which they can actually take in a certain amount of time. And, uh, and you know, the guy that had nothing to say about that because he knows, man. I'm sitting there thinking that there's another guy on the YouTube channel about three months ago. And I said I didn't like the the uh, the banking, but what's it called? Uh, bank on yourself thing, the infinite banking. I don't like that. And, and the guy was saying, well, your know, mass mutual pays 6%. And I said, OK, so if I've dropped $100,000 in there today, what is it worth in 10 years? And I, I just tell him what the cash value is worth. And he said the cash value is worth, I don't know, 98000 bucks. I said, well, where's the 6%? He goes, well, you have to take into account the surrender charges and stuff. I said, but that's not what you said. You said this pays 6%. You didn't say it pays 6%, but you got to take into consideration the surrender charge. You literally said this pays 6%. And if I'm Mr. Joe Schmo out there and Jane Schmo, and I'm just like, look, I like the guy. I know him from church, and I think he's an honorable guy. Maybe he served in the military or something like that. And I'm hearing him saying I'm getting 6%. I'm thinking I'm getting 6%. And that's okay. So if, if the cash value, I start with $100,000, I fast forward 10 years, I don't have $100,000. Even if I have $102,000, that's not 6%. So I said, what happens in year 20? Because that, that, uh, uh, assuredly, there's no surrender charge in year 20, right? And he said, well, the cash value is like 115. I forgot what it was. But it wasn't anywhere near 6%. I said, wait, 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 wait. So I've had my money in that account for 20 flipping years. I got, again, I'm just, it was 20,000 bucks more than I put it, something like that, some incredibly minimal amount of money. I said, but your your sales pitch is a pay 6%. And I said, hell, I can go around and say, I'll pay you 50%, right? But you're going to pay me back 52% because because of fees and surrender charge, but I can go on on a sales pitch and say, I'm paying you 50%. And that's the thing on these insurance things is a crediting rate. It's not the interest rate. And it drives me flipping crazy. And then the thing, some guys asked about USA uh, income annuities or income annuities as a whole. All right. This is the same kind of thing on annuities. If it's a SPIA, it'll have a distribution yield. It's not an interest rate. And I, man, I used to, back in the early nineties, they had these, I forgot what they're called, uh, charitable gift annuities. And you're thinking, Whoa, this pays 6.8%. Whoa, 6.8%. Well, it's a return of principal with a little of interest thrown in there. But they have this, the, the, the charitable gift annuities will have this thing like the sales pitch. And I don't think I have a magazine. Like, look, for all of you who don't know me well, I am a life member of the NRA. All right. So just unsubscribe now if that bothers you. Uh, the largest civil rights uh, organization in the United States. And you get the NRA magazine and on the back, sometimes you'll see charitable gift annuities for the NRA foundation or something. Like that. I'm just pulling that, using that as an example. And it'll say 6.7%. Now, look, I'm just using that for an example. I'm not saying that's what the NRA is doing or a Forbes magazine is doing it or a, what's the one I used to get from the, I forgot. But anyway, it'll say there's a certain rate that you're getting on a charitable gift annuity. And you're like, wow, that's pretty good because I'm only getting 3% at the bank. But that's not true. That's a return of principal plus an interest rate. You're getting your money back. Probably 5% of that 6.7 is your own money back. And 1% is the interest rate that you're getting. And that's what the insurance guys will allow a client to believe. But the thing that ticks me off is once that sucker is signed, sealed, and delivered, if the client doesn't read the prospectus, he has 15 to 30 days, what's called a free look period, to basically renege on the contract without any surrender charge, any penalty. If he didn't know to do that, or she, because she just didn't take the time, she can't get out of it after 30 days. It's stuck. I just, And then you see somebody like the I did a video yesterday on the Ed Jones with the VUL, Variable Universal Life Insurance. Man, you put uh, $20,000 in there the first year, you only got 740 bucks as a surrender value after year one. So if you said, man, this thing, I got robbed here. I want my money back. They'll say, you're going to lose everything. It's crazy. Oh, man. It, it oh, ticks me off. All right. Well, I, was, I don't even know why I got on that uh, uh, tangent. I just it, it ticks me off, these insurance guys, because they're not regulated the same degree as in licensed investment guys. And, and look, I, I will be the first, the first to acknowledge from a pure financial planning perspective, my friends, insurance guys know better. They do. Investment guys are raised on investments. 
I guarantee if you go to an insurance guy with Mass Mutual or Northwestern Mutual, he'll financial plan uh, the rings around the guy from Fisher Investments. I guarantee uh, because that's what the, that's how they sell their product. But the state planning and various strategies using insurance. The guys from Fisher Investments, they sell their product on. We can outperform that guy over there. And you see those commercials where the, the Fisher Investment guys, you know, he's got a guy sitting down, the rich guy sitting down and the Fisher Investment guys and the other guy. And so what's happening here is that's all they're doing. The investment guys, they're all renting money from each other. So they got a, a number of people out there. Some of y'all might even say, I'm willing to pay an investment guy 1% fee. So Fisher Investments is going to say our investment prowess and process is better than that guy. That guy's going to say theirs is better than Fisher Investments. That's not creating wealth. That's just renting money. So Fisher Investments might be the best game in town today. But two years from now, it might be creative planning because you saw Tony Robbins or something. I don't know what it's going to be. But on insurance, they know it's different. They know they got to do financial planning because they can't sell investment products necessarily unless they're licensed. And a lot of the insurance guys don't want to be licensed because there's no, they know there's more regulatory uh, hoops they got to uh, jump through. And so they can say more things like leave it to the consumer to have the understanding of a 6% crediting rate versus a 6% interest rate. And I just, I find that to be, uh, I find that to be just bad. It's bad for the whole industry and certainly bad for the consumer. It ticks me off. All right. Uh, let's see here. Run, uh, see, hey, JD, I am in a similar position. I'm going to take distributions for my 401k for, yeah. Hey, bro, what's up, skeptic? Skeptic, right on. Oh, boy, I'm not sure what kind of skeptic you are, but uh, it's all good. I'm a skeptic, too. Trust me, man, once you go down the road of being a contrarian, it's not all peaches and cream, that's for sure. Uh, you're a skeptic by nature, and it's, uh, it's always a challenge, but it'll make you better in the wrong, long run to be skeptical. Uh, what did you hear about New Zealand? Some lady had a tattoo. There's a music festival and they thought it was a right wing tattoo, whatever right wing is anymore. I don't know. Uh, and they evacuated the concert uh, in New Zealand because she had a tattoo that someone thought was right wing and she, someone thought she was acting suspicious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, scary stuff, man. Um, run through my save money first though. I hope to have a 30 year retirement and a higher social security pension to raise my income uh, without RMDs. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to heritage after the summer. Uh, Jay. Okay. Uh, employer pays 6% interest on savings. I'm dumping into it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the 401k does return well. And I also think taxes. Uh, I also think taxes are only going up. So I have uh, future tax on the interest. What are your thoughts? Uh, the 401k not doing well doesn't inherently mean anything. That that might be your investment choices or what you chose. I, I don't know what, what you mean by the 401k not doing well. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, that could be you need to change your investments or hopefully you just got index funds to be done with it. And, you know, there are sometimes uh, the markets won't do well, but they certainly could in the long run. Absolutely. In the long run, you know, I don't know what that would be. It might take 10 years, might take five, might take a year. I just don't know. But um, oh yeah, I want to talk about that too. Okay. Uh, but man, if they're, if they're dumping 6% interest, I'd, I'd take that like, like you're doing without question. Um, I think tax only going up. So I have future. Yeah. I don't know what the future tax on the interest. If it's in a 401k, uh, everything comes out of your 401k is tax for sure. Um, yeah, I'm not falling that far as Mark employer pays 6% interest on savings. Uh, okay. So if it's a tax, so let me, I, I want to be very, very clear on how this works or any kind of taxable account, uh, be it a savings account, be it a bond, uh, be it a dividend stock, a mutual fund. If there is a dividend or any kind of 1099 distribution, be it an interest, be it a, a capital gain or dividend, and it's not in an IRA, 401k or Roth or any kind of deferred plan, you're paying interest, you're paying tax on it regardless. I, a lot of people think if they reinvest the interest, they're not paying tax. Uh, no, nothing could be further from the truth. At the end of the year, you're going to get a 1099 form, be an INT or DIV or an I, yeah, INT, DIV, uh, 10, yeah, it'll be one of those. And if you get it, that's what you got to declare as your interest that you receive from the IRS, uh, I, interest or dividend or capital gain. I th the 1099 DIV will be for capital gains on a mutual fund as well. So, the, so, but anyway, if you get one of those forms, you got to pay tax. 
just keep that in mind. So if you got interest from the bank, you're paying tax. If you got interest from a stock or mutual fund, you're paying tax, even if you didn't do anything. And this is why I hark on why I like the Vanguard so much is because they'll show, well, all prospectus has to do this. They have to show you their gross returns, the returns after distributions for taxes and the returns after distributions, the sale of the fund. And so you might have a gross return of 10%, a, a return after uh, taxes on the distributions at nine, a return of the after tax on the distributions, a sale of funds at eight. And you got to look at that number because the only thing that matters is what you get back. So you got to look at the, the perspectives. Okay, this return is saying it's done 10% before taxes, but after taxes, it did seven. I'll take the 9% return that did 9% before taxes. If after taxes, it did eight and a five, 8.5, I'll take that any day of the week. You got to look at the net net uh, after returns on taxes of distributions. I would still look at the after returns of tax on sales, but that, that's something you can control. You can't control distributions though. So I'm just telling you, man, everybody's out there. Don't just look at the gross returns. I literally could care less. I, I want to care about the net returns after distrib after taxes on distributions because that's your dividends, capital gains, and interest that pays. And that's what matters because that's the 1099 you're going to get that you got to give to your tax guy or TurboTax, and then that's how much you're going to pay in tax. And if that's a big amount, that's a net loss. To you. There's no other way around that. Um, uh, by the time, okay. Could 130 income in 2030 be treated 70 to, uh, could 130,000 income in 2030 be treated as 70 K income today? I'm not sure. Hey, what's up, Monty? What's going on, Texas? Yeah, I'm not sure what you're asking me there, man. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Mike Carpenter's a tattoo on the right arm. I guess it made a right wing. Did you hear about the lady uh, who is a fact checker who saw some guy, I think with the uh, the Coast Guard, I believe, who had, or maybe it's the NSA, who had what she, he, uh, she thought was a Nazi tattoo uh, and docks this guy. And that fact checker is now writing for the New Yorker. <laughs> like, what the? <laughs> she's a fact checker couldn't get her facts right dock some innocent guy who's a veteran honorably served as veteran and uh with his unit his his unit in the coast guard so i can't remember and she docks him and now she's writing for the new yorker oh yeah yeah is there a limit on what i can convert to roth ira for my 401k each year no you do man heck no yeah you do the whole thing in one fell swoop don't uh, I plan on hanging it up at in three years at 62 and converting everything by 68 or 70. Um, I had a guy, I'll never forget. I, I, I mean, I'll I hate to share all these stories with you. I remember a guy in New York and Long Island, nicest guy you've ever meet. Uh, he converted everything in 2009 or 10, maybe it was 2010. Everything is like a million bucks. He converted all in one fell swoop. I never guess a man, don't do that. You're going to get hammered taxes. But he did it because he's worried about tax rates going up. Uh, and on top of that, New York does have, at least it did back then, I don't know what it is now, a state a state tax once you had over a million dollars. And in this case, he would still be subject to a state tax for the state of New York, but it'd be lessened because the taxes had to be paid. Uh, and then at least there's not what's called IRD, income with respect to decedent. And that's the taxes due that you owe if you inherit an IRA or 401k. So he says, look, I'd rather pay the tax up front, be done with it, It'll reduce my estate, and then whatever is left will be transfer tax-free to my heirs. So I won't have to pay Cuomo that much on estate tax, and then my heirs won't have to pay Cuomo that much of income tax, and at that point, it's Obama, and I didn't want to have to do that. I said, I don't think you should do that. But anyway, long story short, he did it. He knew what he was doing. And uh, man, that guy, pfft. so that million bucks, he paid $350,000 in the uh, feds. We took that all out of the IRA. So it went from a million to uh, six fifty. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't. Uh, when I left USA, that was worth well over a million bucks. Well over, I think it was like two point two million or something like that. And he's still, I mean, he's an older guy too, and he did just fine. So, the moral of the story is, if you do it right, in this case, lucky, uh, it'll be a wonderful thing to convert. If you do it wrong, uh, in this case, uh, let's say the market kept it going down, uh, that would have been a bad move on his part. But you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good for sure. Uh, let's see here. Okay, there you go. Jeff says, uh, uh, to you, JD, 130K is about 100K in today's dollars. 
use a okay, right on. Good, good, good. Um, I'm not a fan of TIA. Not now. They have the annuity. The TIA annuity is good without question. I would never, 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 never argue that. I just don't like them. I don't like that guy Roger Ferguson. I don't like the people I've known who worked at TIA Cref. I just they're some of the most. Let's just put it this way: they're, the wealth management arm is staffed by some of the greediest people you've ever met, and they they say that they're uh, for the common good or whatever like that. And then if you talk to the wealth, I, look, I know tons of people. Tons of people came uh, from TIA on the wealth management side. And I interviewed them a couple of times back probably 10 years ago. They were recruiting me pretty hard when I was in Philly. And uh, the whole thing was I could make all this money. And I was like, you know, look, I don't look, man, I'm a poor boy from Maine and on an island in Maine. I don't need to make all this money. <laughs> so what if I made $500,000 a year selling crappy old products to people who trust us? What good is that going to do me, man? I, I don't need that kind of money because at that point you're working 70 hours a week. I don't want to do that crap. But that was their whole sales pitch is how much money you can make. I said, whatever happened to the common good? I just hate hypocrites. And so I'm not a fan of TIA. And uh, and I'd say the same thing about USA if they ever, you know, there are a couple of times there USA seemed to go a little bit against the grain of a veteran service organization. They, they I think they get a lot of pushback from their uh, – their members to bring them back, steer them correctly. But sometimes I can see USA going that road too. And uh, the problem is that they hire these HR people from the Ivy leagues uh, from big city, New York and whatnot, who come down and staff these places. And uh, they bring the progressive politics with them. There's no other way around that. And TIA Kreff is absolutely part and parcel of that. But other firms that you would not expect to be like that, like USA have the same kind of thing. I mean, they're hiring the recruiting agents from, I mean, I'm just telling you, this is what happened. And their marketing departments too. I mean, it's the same thing. The marketing departments are staffed and their HR departments are staffed by these progressive uh, people from the big cities. And they go to a place like San Antonio and they bring those big cities uh, with them. And that's, it doesn't fit well for a lot of people. It's like, wait, 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 look, you know, this isn't the way it should be. And TI Crafts is hypocritical. Because, I mean, literally that's what they said. You can make money here, money. It's like, we're have the greater good. Hypocrites. Uh, had dinner at Ruby's. Oh man, had dinner at Ruby's barbecue. Rudy's barbecue. There you go, Monty. You're a good man. Yeah, uh, damn. <laughs> Hell, why worry about this stuff? Because if you believe tubers like Canadian prepper that we'll have an economic class, so why hoard food on stocks? What say me? Man, I there's so many people out there, Nicholas. Look, I'm a prepper. I, you know, I, I'm a, a tried and true uh, member, a member, MSB member of the uh, Survival Podcast. Jack Spurco down in Texas. I'm I'm long time MSB member of that uh, member support brigade, and that's uh, I've learned a lot. Now, a lot of those guys I know decently. Um, and for me, prepping isn't about economic collapse. Pre prepping is more about when the freaking tornadoes go through Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, or the power's out for you know for five to seven days. Yeah, what do you do to create your own electricity? What I hope you have a food source and things of that nature. I mean, and so for me, being a prepper is one hundred percent about the common sense stuff that happens. You know, some of these guys will get too deep in the EMP stuff, and I, I don't discount that. Uh, as much as you know, some would even Jack would discount the EMP. I, I think there is some validity to an EMP, but at the end of the day, I mean, what are you going to do about it? I mean, so you 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 take care of what you can take care of. That way, if things happen, and especially as a Christian, uh, you have enough that you can take care of your family, but then you can go out and help other people who are in need. Which is why I always advocate the idea of growing a food forest, uh, storing gas, you know, some gasoline and rotating gasoline cans that we have a, a current supply of, you know, ideally 60 gallons. So, if, you know, 12 five gallon gas tanks that you mark one, two, three, four for the month of the year and rotate those suckers out. So you always have 60 gallons there to run generators to run your car. Because don't forget, your car battery can serve as a generator if you just have some basic tools. Um, so I, I, the whole economic collapse thing is just it's just I, I don't get it. It's you know if it bleeds it leads fear sells I get it but I I, I don't know what are you gonna do I, but I also have goal I mean I think you know there's always I mean we have enough history historical evidence to say it's worth it to have some gold coins that doesn't mean you think you're worried about the zombies attacking or the commies coming in but having some gold coins inherently makes sense just to be on a secure knowledge that hey. If it does really hit the fan, I know gold does maintain its value for many a year. I mean, it has. Going back to Jesus, 
one of the three things, the wise men brought to Jesus, gold. Hmm. And I have other stories on gold, which I won't share with you here, but, uh, but I'm a big fan. I use uh, ETFs uh, tax. Well, that's what you should do, my man, Dave. Uh, ETFs. So Dave says ETFs in a taxable account. That is so spot on. If I have my choice between ETFs and mutual funds in a taxable account, I'm taking an ETF 100 times out of 100. Some guy on the YouTube channel a while back was saying you know, Vanguard index funds have the same tax advantage as ETFs do. I, I'm not quite sure I believe that. I, I, I looked it up a little bit. And I kind of got a little bit of ping pong on that. ETFs have much more taxable advantages uh, because of that. They don't have to give you a capital gain distribution. So if I'm buying the Vanguard, I'll just use this for an example. I, you know, if I, what, what, let's not use Vanguard. Let's use if I'm buying American funds, growth fund of America, or the Vanguard growth, large cap growth index ETF, and I have a taxable account, you get, you'd be crazy to buy the growth fund of America. You'd be crazy to buy a Fidelity Magellan. You got to buy the ETF because a taxable, the way an ETF is set up, they don't send capital gains to you. They don't. And because that's much more tax efficient. Now you will get dividends, but you're not going to get capital gains. I'm telling you right now, I'll say this to blue in the face. I'll never forget. I had a lady come to my office here in Alfred, Georgia, and she had 200,000 bucks in American Century Mutual Funds, which are down for the year. I think this is 2013, uh, 12, 13. Anyway, they're down for the year, probably down 10%. So she was fired up. Now, I didn't sell it. I didn't know who this lady was. She just came in and she threw them on the desk. She had her uh, her thing, her, uh, her end of year statement said, I bought these funds through USAA. I think she bought them on her own, actually, because we didn't make any recommendation on that stuff. And she goes, look at this. They're down 10%. I said, yeah, the markets were down, whatever. She goes, no, it's not that. It's this. And then she showed me the 1099, uh, uh, 10, I forgot, 109 dividend she got, DIV. Yeah, DIV. She had $40,000 of taxable distributions on a, on a mutual fund that was down 10%. $40,000 on $200,000 of taxable distribution. So what's that? Uh, is that 20%? Yes, yeah, 20% of her portfolio was paid out as a capital gain, even though she was down for the year. It never happened in ETF. It never happened in ETF. But she was fit to be tied, man. I, whew, they want nothing. I tell you. If she comes from some of these backwoods of Georgia, some of these people, man, they'll they'll eat you alive. And uh, and so I I told her I said, man, that's uh, I asked her how she bought that fund. Turns out she bought it from some other firm that transferred into USA, but she felt USA should have told her about it. I said, we don't. That's not our fund. I mean, it's American Century funds. That's the thing about being a DIY investor. Do it yourself. Doggone better know what those distributions are going to be at the end of the year, so you can either get out of it. Uh, before it's too late or just recognize and save some money on the side for taxes. So that was a big problem. Uh, if I convert my 401k pre-tax money to my Roth IRA when I retire in three years, won't it cost me as much as later in the RMDs? Uh, uh, won't it cost, as, cost me as much as later? And yeah, I don't, I mean, literally just gotta, just gotta run the numbers, man. Um, I, no way to know off on, off top of my head and just gotta run the numbers. Uh, Mike Carpenter, tough to pay current rates in the 30s, 30 percent to avoid unknown tax in the future. I, I probably going back to what J.D. was saying. I agree with that. I 100 percent agree. But remember, when you have an IRA RMD or 401k RMD, there's a four taxes that are going to be happening here. Now, I can't remember if J.D. said he had a pension or not. But if you don't have a pension and you have IRA RMDs, required minimum distributions, and 401k RMDs, required minimum distribution. And let's presume you don't have a pension. That's going to do one of two. That's going to do one of four things, if not all four. It's going to put you in a higher tax bracket, first and foremost, because you were in a lower tax bracket, most likely. Now you got this higher uh, ordinary income that you got to pay tax on, so your tax bracket can go up. Number two, it's going to increase more of your taxes on your Social Security benefit. I did a video on this just the other day, the double taxation of Social Security. So now that $10,000 of income you receive from a required minimum distribution actually makes your taxable income go by $18,500. So I received $10,000 of spending money, but I have to declare an extra $18,500 in taxable income because of the way the tax code is. And this is where I learned this from an insurance guy, by the way. So as much as I kill on insurance guys, this is, I never learned this in investments, 10, 15 years in investments. I didn't learn that. I learned it from an insurance guy. And I said, that can't be true. 
And that was in 2010. And lo and behold, it was absolutely true, 2011. All right, on top of that, what happens to us as well? Well, if you used to be in the 12% tax bracket, now that pushes you up in the 24, 22% tax bracket. Now you're going to have to pay taxes on your capital gains, long-term capital gains, and your qualified dividends, where previously you did not. Those are tax-free to you. So your RMDs affect your Social Security, put you up in a higher tax bracket, and now you got to pay taxes on your qualified dividends and long-term capital gains. So there's four things. On top of that, to make it even funner, hard to get there when you're married filing jointly, but uh, if you leave that to your surviving spouse, he or she is probably going to be in a higher tax bracket from an income, uh, not higher tax bracket, from a higher income perspective, and now is going to have to pay more on her Medicare. And so if we look at the IRMA, uh, the, I forgot, I always forget what IRMA stands for. It's the income, I forgot. So IRMA is a, if you reach a certain threshold on your Medicare for premiums, from modified adjusted gross income, you have to pay more. So a single taxpayer with an MAGI, modified adjusted gross income, includes tax exempt interest, by the way. If she has uh, above $85,000 of modified adjusted gross income, this is in 2000. Uh, in 18. So this year is a little bit higher. She'll have to pay an extra uh, 28% on Medicare Part B and Part D premiums. Hmm. Uh, if she has over 107000 in modified adjusted gross income, she'll, her Medicare Part B and Part D will double from 135 to two to 270 uh, and, then it's, and then it goes up the corridor. And once she gets above 160 her Medicare premiums quadruple. And if you think Social Security is in dire straits, wait to see what happens to Medicare. It's in a whole world of hurt, man. And if you think that is bad, it's only going to get worse because Medicare, we've only been paying what we pay FICA 7.65, of which 6.2 goes to OASDI. Uh, so what's that? 7.65 minus 6.2 is 1.45. So you're paying 1.45. I'm paying 1.45 as the employer. So if all of our FICA taxes, uh, that's 2.9% on both sides are going in to pay for Medicare. Uh, that ain't enough. Medicare is a hurting unit, hurting, hurting, hurting. And I do want to just say real, something real quick when I'm yapping here on Social Security. Devin, had, uh, Devin Carroll he had a wonderful video the other day. He talked about the trustees report and how their assumptions are based on good, what is it, low, medium, and high unemployment. That's what it was, low, medium, and high and uh, the basic was that Social Security trustees report was based on uh, median unemployment being five and a half percent going forward for the next 70 years, essentially. And I thought it was pretty interesting because I just looked the other day and we are down right at four percent right now. Four percent unemployment. And we've been there for quite some time. And so the issue is if the trustee report is based on five and a half percent unemployment and that's where we're going to have this you know, catastrophe come 2034. Well, what happens if we don't have that five and a half percent unemployment? What happens if we remain well below that? It begins to look a lot better. But the problem is that's not the case with Medicare. That's not because Medicare is based on a non-fixed cost, i.e. the health insurance costs of all these baby boomers going in and needing health needs. Or at least Social Security is kind of a fixed cost. They know exactly what the payout's got to be. They know they say this is what we got to pay. Anyway, so I thought it was interesting. Another reason not to be so negative on Social Security, uh, you probably want to focus your uh, attention on Medicare as well. I do want to say something else real quick. I was reading this. This is from the Census Bureau. Um, I've never been a, a big union guy, even though, uh, again, I come from a very left, very left wing union rabble rouser family. We used to have a printing press in, my, in our basement, my folks did, and uh, is all for the worker. Um, and like I said before, we used to have Gus Hall and Angela Davis literature uh, in our house. Uh, so for you youngsters, you might not know what that means, but just it ain't right wing. All right. But anyway, there's something about this that was actually quite concerning to me because I was, I was researching this for my next book. And this is households meeting income of all races uh, in the United States uh, from 1975 to 2017. And, uh, and you're not going to be able to see this, but in 1999, the median income in current dollars was $60,000 a year in 1999. The median income in current dollars in 2016, uh, 2016 was $60,000 a year in current, in current dollars as well. 
which means essentially we made no increase in median income in the from the last was that 18 years or so not it stayed flat in median income and yet the cost the the, the purchasing power of that sixty thousand dollars fell by half because literally forty thousand dollars is what it was in two thousand nineteen ninety nine dollars, which is now sixty thousand dollars today. All right, and so basically the, the the income stayed flat, but the cost has gone up, and so the purchasing power, the inflationary aspect in this low inflation environment, ate a half of that income alive. It's uh it's bad, and I just I sat there, I said that that's not good. Uh, that that does bother me quite a bit uh, because we've had a low inflationary. All right. We've had basically unions eliminated in the private workforce, which I think the pendulum has probably swung too far. We've had a huge influx of cheap labor. And I hate to say it, but we, we have. And that cheap labor has done nothing but drive down wages. And we've had major outsourcing. And we can see it here in the, the income, the median income of the, and that's the median. This is an average, the median. So basically for 20 years, the income hasn't risen at all. But yet, it, in terms of real income, has gone down by about fifty percent when you factor in inflationary. And I, I, that's from the Census Bureau. That's not just some right wing rag or some union rag. It's, it's literally from the Census Bureau. And I find that to be a, I find that to be bad. But I find it also to be uplifting in a way too, because you can only keep things under, you know, you can only push it down for so long before it has to explode up. And so I think wages have a high prop probability of increasing pretty significantly because of that unemployment stand at 4% and (laughs) there's not that many workers out there. All right. So we had a low unemployment and we've had a low unemployment for a long time. We've had a, uh, a wage that's been kept low because of corporatist uh, policies by both Republicans and Democrats. There's no other way around it. Uh, Clinton, Bush, uh, Bush, Obama, uh, I mean, it's a Democrat and Republican. I mean, hell, the, the first Bush. I mean, these are corporatists like you wouldn't believe. And I do think they've been keeping the wages suppressed uh, with their corporatist policies. And now that we have a guy in there, be it Trump, maybe Bernie. I don't like Bernie, but I do like Trump. But I think Bernie would be a better alternative than like a Jeb Bush. I think at the end of the day, that's going to you know, we're having a battle of Wall Street versus Main Street. And I think it seems to be there might be some allegiance shifting away from Wall Street and towards Main Street, and that's going to increase wages, which I think could really do a lot of good for Social Security. Why do I say that? Because of Social Security taxes. <laughs> I mean, if the median wage is 60000 bucks, that means that's only what people are paying Social Security taxes. If we can get the median wage at $70,000, people are paying that much more in Social Security taxes. It's a wonderful thing. So not only do people have increasing purchasing power, but they also pay more into Social Security, which is solidified for better. So Anyway, that's uh, that that really uh, it it, uh, it it bothers me quite a bit because the facts are those guys out there working haven't made any increase in real money. They haven't, and yet they've actually seen their wages stay flat, but yet their uh, purchasing power has gone down. That, that can't can't keep happening. All right, so let's keep going down. Haddonfield, New Jersey. Who I saw somebody on there, man. Who was that from Haddonfield? Because I used to. Uh, Greg Hart from Hatfield, man. I used to live in Hatfield, Greg. That's nuts, man. Right on. I used to live on Maple Street, right there on Maple and uh, uh, whatever that was. I went to Cherry Hill Mall. I'm drawing a blank on that. Maple and uh, I forgot what that, that street was. Uh, right on. I loved Hatfield, except uh, couldn't own firearms. Uh, I think it was in a Wall Street Journal article showed the budget of someone making 500000 a year. Living. Yeah, no, I, there was an article. Uh, I saw like that, Mike, uh, about someone living in, in New York City making like a million bucks and she was a hedge fund manager or something like that. I, I, I think I did a video on that, actually, uh, probably the beginning of the uh, the YouTube channel back in April. And it's just sad. Uh, everyone's situation is different. Josh worked my numbers last fall. I know it's going to be for me to work. Uh, yep, right on. I uh, could, ha- could not be happy to be hanging up that crappy old job <laughs> right on. Marty, God bless you. Uh, all right, whatever, man. Uh, grim perspective wife's fees with TIA seem reasonable or for yeah, the fees that's right. I don't go the, the managed money product, absolutely. Uh, in my opinion, converting to Roth once they're already at or really close to retirement age is uh, is not a great idea in a lot of cases, always exceptions. Yep. Uh, Steve uh, Adler says, huge payback check coming in a couple months, company match 401k, my contributions to max out my 401k. Uh, you, you have any advice on how to use the extra as an investment? Uh, 
outside the 401k, I would make that sucker as aggressive as I could possibly be, Steve, or Steven. I'd make that sucker as aggressive as I could possibly be with ETFs. <laughs> Low dividends, ETFs, aggressive. You want to get that puppy grown as much as you can. You don't want to pay tax on it at all while you're alive. And that way, when you die, you'll go to your survivors tax-free because step up in basis. And hopefully, you never touch that money. Never touch the money. Touch the 401k. Let your taxable accounts just grow and grow and grow and grow. Leave your 401k to yourself to consume and let that money outside the 401k just grow like a crazy, like a crazy man. I got to find a different word than crazy, man. I used to say like a, a drunken sailor. Then my Navy friends might get offended. Um, so I got to find a different, but just let it grow like a weed. How about that? Let it grow like a weed. And then at your death, they'll transfer to heirs tax free. Uh, Salma, good, yeah, right on Salma. Good to have you here from the great state of Michigan. Uh, I will say in my uh, podcast, I did my man, uh, Mark Kohler. He talked a lot about uh, health savings accounts. All right, I, I haven't done a lot of research, a lot of YouTube videos on HSAs, but uh, I'm going to now. He got me, my interest peaked. So going back to you, Stephen, you might want to look at HSAs. So Mark Kohler talked a lot about the health savings accounts and I like, I liked him. Uh, he did say one thing that I, I took issue. I don't want to take issue with it uh, on the podcast, but he says the number one cause for bankruptcy is healthcare. It's simply not true. That, that literally, and he didn't say it like he was making it up. He's reading it as everybody does. I'm looking there. I got a tab up here from Nerd Wallet. I got no, I just healthcare is the number one cause of bankruptcy. It's simply, it's simply not true. Uh, they're using a 2012 uh, Harvard study that also uses a 2009 Harvard study, and the study is just it's it's. I tell you, man, you, you can't trust any of these academics anymore. Uh, it's just as bad. I, I'll do a video on that. I was meant to do it today. I just forgot. I've already done a video on that back in May, uh, but May, I didn't have as many subscribers. I do now, so I'll do it again. The reason I say that is because I got a lady I'm working with, a good friend of mine. I'm looking at my text because she had texted me. She's trying to quit her crappy old job, uh, but she says, uh, uh, she's worried about, uh, she, she's so worried about the health insurance. She's literally, it's, it's, it's killing her, killing her, but she's so worried about the health insurance, uh, that, you know, cause she doesn't want to go bankrupt if she didn't have health insurance. I said, why don't you just take Cobra and Cobra is a thousand dollars a month. And she goes, well, that's a lot of money. I was like, for, you're going to do it for three months. And then you go on the health insurance from your company. Yeah. But See, this, this is uh, where I'm sitting there thinking, but you hate your job. I mean, you literally hate your job. It's killing you. You got tons of money. I mean, she has all kinds of money. That's the thing working at certain firms. You get a lot of money put away. I said, a thousand bucks a month, Cobra. And then you get out of your crappy old job. You get into this nice job that offers offers you a pension and offers you retirement health care, too. I just we're so it's it, it's scary how much fear we have of health crisis. And I just Find it to be. I mean, look, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just uh, anyway. All right, uh, that's why I made a video breaking into top brand sales in three seconds or less. Silently. I'm thinking I'm living about half my gross income, only about half my net income with tax at twenty percent. There you go. Uh, retiring two years, should I just put everything in an IRA now? I. Why would you put into an IRA? I wouldn't. I mean, I don't get it. And I mean, is there some significant tax benefit to doing that? I bet not. Or are you saying from your 401k to an IRA? I, I don't know what you're, what you're saying there, my man. Uh, since Josh is no, okay, you might feel the uh, hiring a financial planner. Uh, I, I'm a fan of uh, the, eh, to some degree, the Garrett Financial Network. I'm a fan of that uh, just because they do state their fees up front. And they do take hourly consultations. I like the hourly consultation. I wish we'd go more than that. I uh, did a couple of videos uh, just hammering the investment industry today uh, because I think we need to change. I think we need to change big time from managing money for a fee and calling ourselves a fiduciary. I had a 19 year old young guy uh, email me and he said, hey, he wants to get into financial planning. He's 19. Uh, he wants to be a fiduciary so he can help people in a, in a righteous way. And I said, man, uh, so let me just why well, I got this platform. Just because someone says a fiduciary, I don't give two craps. Pardon my French. I don't care uh, because I'm telling you right now, you look at dimensional fund advisors and you look at Vanguard and all these people, these fiduciaries, their academic prowess, uh, science behind investing. They're saying they're fiduciaries and yet they're charging 1%. And they're going to show you the DFA funds that perform Vanguard. I said, okay, but can I buy the DFA funds without your freaking 1% fee? 
Uh, no. Okay. Then how come you don't show me the fee, uh, the fund performance with your freaking one percent fee? That's what I'm saying. But they're fiduciaries. I, I don't get it. How can it be a fiduciary and not show the fees that you're charging as part of the performance? If you're going to show this fund versus this other fund, how can you not show the fee that you charge? I, I literally don't get that. And on top of that, how, really, one of the guys was charged up to 2%. I was like, how can you be calling yourself a fiduciary if you're charging 2%? I, I, I don't get it. And you're going to say you're better than that guy over Ed Jones who's putting people in American funds with a 2.5% front end commission with no more fees other than a 25 basis point trail? Ah, oh, it takes me off. I, it just this whole thing. It's like these insurance guys who allow their clients not to understand the difference between a crediting rate and actual interest rate. It's the same thing. These fiduciaries. I'm a fiduciary. I got CFP. You know, those guys over there, they're not fiduciaries. So I'm better. Well, are, are you? I just, uh, yeah. Mike, that uh, jumped from the 12 to 22 is brutal. 60% increase, my man. 60% increase. Yep. You got to try to avoid that jump from 12 to uh, 22 for sure. Uh, um, Mar uh, Marty says, I felt the world had been lifted from my shoulders after he finished my plan. Good night, Marty. Uh, I'd read book after book, having having me run the numbers was the uh, only thing that gave me peace. Wishing you the best. Uh, well, and thank you, ma'am. That's uh, that's that's good stuff there. I appreciate that. Um, Let's see where we go. We got my, my, I guess, redhead, my commie man. He said he was a commie, but he says, uh, I hate everything in silver and gold when I can. No one goes to Uncle Sam when I'm dead. You got to do what you got to do, brother. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. At the end of the day, you got to be able to sleep at night. If I take pension at 59 and Social Security at 62, I'm already about 5000 a month at 62. If I wait till I'm 65... Man, I just, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, JD. I just, I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, let's see. What is your opinion on the new zero funds at Fidelity? I, I, Toronto, I, look, I like them. My, my, my opinion on Fidelity is, and I know what's going to happen, um, is that it's a loss leader for them. All right. What I mean by that, it gives you, uh, gives them access to call you uh, later on to upsell you. I, I mean, look, I know this is what's going to happen. I've heard it. I just know. And so you're getting zero basis points to ETFs. That's great. And then you're going to get, it's kind of like the right capital software, all right? Right capital software, I like it. The drawback is you get called. Once you start using it, you're going to get some guy calling you on occasion. Just, I don't know, who needs that crap? And so I just, that's, Vanguard doesn't do that. I mean, will they ever do it? Maybe. Um, I highly suspect they won't because Vanguard is owned by you, the shareholder. Fidelity is owned by the Johnson family who are worth billions of dollars. When John Bogle died, rest his soul, he was not worth billions of dollars. I think his net worth was like 80 million or something like that, which look, it ain't chump change, but for the value he brought to the, the humanity, <laughs> 80 million bucks that the Bogle fame was worth was a drop in the bucket to the value that he brought to, to humanity. That's for sure. Has the Johnson family brought that much value? I, you know, look, I'm not here to disparage Fidelity. Look, I, I don't want to, but Vanguard is better. It's just my opinion, my opinion. But I just, I like Vanguard is owned by the shareholders. Johnson family owns Fidelity. Uh, so you go to Fidelity for the free stuff and, you know, I'm sure it'd be solicited. Is that a bad thing? Will they tell you that up front? So I'll take it for what it's worth. And look, I know people work Fidelity. They probably hate me right now for saying that. I just, that's my, that's my, uh, it's the way I feel. Uh, my man, Jeff, uh, my man, Jeff, uh, just lost his battery. Got to get a battery bank, man. <laughs> Where did the boofers go? I'm not sure what that is. I work at the U.S. All right. Post office. I've been telling the guys I work with about you. Uh, we're truck drivers. They're pleasantly surprised how much more they'll get by delaying Social Security. Hey, right on, Rodney. Much obliged there for sure, man. Uh, the more people you bring onto the YouTube channel, the more YouTube recognizes me and the more money I get paid. That's all what it matters, right? It's how much gets paid here because I'm making bank at YouTube. <laughs> Some of these guys are, man. It's nuts. Who was that guy? Uh, Wrangle Star. Wrangler Star or something like that? I, I mean... <laughs> I think someone said that guy was making like 500000 a year on YouTube or something. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Crazy. Uh, I did a video with a, a guy uh, out of Mississippi, and he's down in Texas, Flemlo Raps. If you're into football, 
this guy has the best YouTube channel at all. It talks about like where ha what happened to Maurice Claret, what happened to Troy Smith, what happened to all these different, not just Ohio State guys, but all these guys. Uh, what happened to uh, I don't know, you name it, and uh, and and that guy made it is making enough money where he just bought a house in Houston and he was you know living in an apartment in uh, in I think Baton Rouge with his wife and two kids. And so I, that's why I say go to YouTube, start a channel. I, we had a guy on here commenting that he has his hobby is uh, battery operated. I could have sworn he said older planes like TWA and other things too. And I said, man, do a YouTube channel on that. I guarantee there's people that have a same kind of interest in that. Like I like minor league baseball cards and hockey cards weird, but you know, I don't have time to follow it on YouTube, but I guarantee uh, there's an interest there. I did a video on that too. There's another guy <laughs> named Flossie Carter uh, who <laughs> just watched videos of him and my kids and my wife yesterday cracking up. He opened stuff up, you know, these like Samsung uh, things. And he talks about the box and it's just, it's entertaining, man. And that guy's making all kinds of money on YouTube just as entertaining. He's like, I like the way the, the box is colored. I thought it was pretty good. And you're like, why am I watching this? But it's fun. And we're all just cracking up with this guy, Flossie Carter. And he's making he's making all kinds of money on YouTube. It's pretty cool. Uh, California housing is through the roof. Yep. Uh, yeah. My, <laughs> get the hell out of there. And my man CB from California, I've been telling him, but uh, he can't because he's got a job up there that pays pretty well. Uh, so, uh, let's see, silver and gold are tax free and you can hold them. There you go. Silver and gold. Who knows this song? Silver and gold. It's old school, old school cartoons. Uh, uh, I thought the order of distribution was taxable, uh, tax deferred followed by tax free. I don't know. Not in the least for me, Corey. I <laughs> hell no. Should be tax deferred, taxable, and then tax free. I mean, every situation dictates, but if I had one way to say for the vast majority of people, take it from your tax deferred first, my goodness, take it from your taxable next and then tax free last. Absolutely. Chowda says I put a half retirement in TIA guarantee currently paying 4%. Yeah, no, that's that's a good account. That's one of the accounts at TIA. That's a good one. Uh, want some secure out? Yeah, no, man. <laughs> 4% guarantee from, I, there's a New York city and there's a guy who emailed me earlier today. Uh, they had, they were paying, they had a guarantee is why it's probably going bankrupt, but they're guaranteeing their pensioner six and a half guaranteed minimum guaranteed return. I don't know if they still do. I dealt with a lot of New York city people when I was at USA because New York city was my territory and they had the city pensions paying six and a half guaranteed minimum or six and a quarter, six, but three, I forgot was as well into the 6% guaranteed minimum. And I say, why in God's green earth would anyone roll that out? It'd be crazy to. In fact, a fiduciary would suggest you roll it out. And I say, you are no longer a fiduciary, my friend. So in that case, 4% guaranteed. Nah, I mean, I, I wouldn't. That's you can't shake a stick of that, brother. Uh, let's see. If I've ever. Oh, that's George. OK, I'm not sure about George Soros. I wish D.C. would allow a one time transfer to a 401k to an HSA. Uh, yeah. And I think someone had asked about that and I didn't get to it with my man, uh, Mark Kohler. I think I looked it up and you can't do the HSA to IRA. Correct me if I'm wrong, if any of y'all know, but uh, I, someone asked me about that. I don't think you can do an HSA to an IRA transfer or an IRA to an HSA. Uh, it's almost like you can't transfer uh, annuities to life insurance, but you can transfer life insurance to annuities. So I always made it, you can't go to Alabama, but you can go to Louisiana. So you can't go AL, annuities to life, but you could go LA, life insurance to annuities. That's the way I always kind of remembered it. I think it's going to be the same thing with HSA to IRA. I don't think those two things can mesh. Um, I'm willing to be wrong that. Uh, serving wings tonight. Nah, dude, we, uh, what do we have tonight? My wife made some uh, good old fashioned spaghetti meatballs, which is good. Uh, hard for broadcast TV to compete with YouTube, man. I, I, Burl Eyes, Mike Carpenter, right on, man. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I tell you, I tell you, Mike, hard for Mike Carpenter says hard for broadcast TV to compete with YouTube. Thus, do your own flipping YouTube channel, my friends. I'm telling you, if you, I'm just telling you, think about this. All these guys, look at the here. You, I mean, there's a hundred people right now watching this guy right here. My 10th Mountain Division t shirt and my crappy old freaking. Well, I did clean up a little bit of my office, but still, I mean, it's 
I, I get that's only 100 people, but uh, who is I was doing a video? Uh, who was it? Wrangler Star, that going back to Wrangler Star. Every video he does, he gets like, he gets like 200,000 views a day. Uh, what's her name? Allison Camerata from CNN. She only gets uh, 500,000 views a day. I guarantee CNN gets a thousand million trillion dollars more in advertising revenue than my man Wrangler Star and YouTube. But so how, think about it. If I'm an ad company and I'm saying, man, you know, I got a product I want to bring to market. Do I want to go on CNN and pay their insane amount of dollars for a, a smaller and smaller and smaller uh, watch? And I have no idea if these people are interested in my product or not. Or do I want to advertise on YouTube where I can specifically identify not the individual, but the individual kind of, you know, a, a guy who's 55 years old who likes fishing or something like that. I mean, just it only makes sense that advertisers are going to say, forget cable, forget broadcast TV. Let's put the advertising dollars on YouTube. So if you have an idea, you know, be it airplane, model airplanes that have battery operated, just I'm telling you, just do it. I, it, you don't have to do it with your big old mug in there either. I mean, tell you, there's a guy who's watching uh, just today. I forgot his name. Man, I'm getting old. But anyway, he doesn't show his face, and he's got a huge YouTube following. I can't remember who it is. Lots of people do. You don't have to show your face, man. So I use Screencast-O-Matic. That's, this isn't Screencast-O-Matic. That's what I use. I use Screencast-O-Matic. I think I pay 100 bucks a year for it. That's it. And I use this a YouTube Chromebook or a, a, Google, a Google Chrome. This is actually a Dell Chrome. Yeah, both these are Dell Chromebooks. We did just buy a Mac uh, because of, this was getting a little bit. Uh, I, I had to get a Mac for a couple of reasons, which I like. And I go back and forth, but you know that's still five hundred bucks. So I probably spent a thousand bucks total on uh, on hardware and software for uh, doing these videos. It's crazy. Now, just re -advise, be advised. No one's going to hear you the first two months. No one will watch. I'm just telling you right now. And I had a good friend of mine, Skip Ritchie from Skip Ritchie Law Firm in St. Louis. Uh, he he got, you know, like a lot of people do, got fired up to do some videos and he just doesn't do them anymore. I wish he would. And I, I know what happens is you get you get constraints. Uh, so if you're going to do it, just remember, no one's going to watch for the first couple. I'm just telling you, no one's going to watch. So just give yourself a year. And, but what you got to do is uh, follow this guy named Miles Beckler, and he will do this thing called he does this thing called a 90 day challenge where you're doing a video a day, a video a day every day. And the reason you're doing that is not because people are going to watch it because no one's going to watch it for those first three months. What's going to happen, though, is you'll get the the um, the, the the momentum, not the momentum, the the structure that you have to do it. It's I have a book on that, actually. Um I can't remember what it's called, but there's a book I read on the habit. That's what it is, a habit. You'll get in the habit of doing it. And once you do it for a certain amount of time, it's not just 21 days. In this case, it really should be 90 days or more. Uh, the habit will be so ingrained in your and just your muscle of your brain that you'll you'll almost feel like you have to do it. And it's wonderful. And once you do it, you'll never stop. It's great because then you'll start if you, you know, if you're doing something of decent quality uh, that's of interest to a number of people. Uh, you'll start getting an audience. And once you get the audience, you're like, man, this is freaking awesome. You love it. And then uh, at some point, you might be able to quit your crappy old job. Like my name, Flemlo. The guy was a, a salesman working at cons. And uh, I think he said Baton Rouge or Mississippi, wherever. Yeah, I think he was living in Baton Rouge. He was making good money. He told his wife, he said, man, I just need a year to do this. If I can't do it, I'll go back to sales. And literally within a year, I mean, he's making more than he was uh, doing that. And uh, now he's making probably three times as much. And uh, and he does it on his own thing. And he's uh, he said he you know he's a uh, he's a uh, he's a small celebrity. He's at the grocery store the other day going to Walmart at 11 o'clock at night. Just moved to Houston and uh, some dude recognized him in Walmart. So if you don't want that to happen to you, just make sure you don't put your face on there. But uh Let's see here. Josh, great show. Enjoying very much. You got it. Uh, what's my favorite anime? I don't watch that. Uh, Burl Ives. Yep, yep. Tax the first. Since you could not tell for certain how your TAS. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm not falling in there. I have uh, tax the first savings. Uh, my 86-year-old mom watches YouTube all day. I <laughs> Right on, Cheryl. I, just, uh, I bet there's a niche there that she follows quite a bit, you know, probably three or four different things. So some political probably. Uh, you got some things on football. You got some things on economics. I watch uh, other, uh, let's see, I watch some finance stuff, some football stuff, some economic stuff. I do like my man, Tony Heller uh, from uh, Climate Change. Uh, he's pretty interesting. Darwin stalling 66 days of that sobriety or is that YouTube? Uh, I'm, you tell me, because either way, you, you, you deserve a pat on the back. 66 days of doing YouTube stuff or sobriety. 
uh, because I've been sober now since May 25th, 1997. And I tell you, but every day is not a challenge. I don't sit there like, oh, I need a beer or anything like that. But, you know, when when you have a drinking or a, an addiction problem at some point, you're never recovered. Every day you're still an addict. So if it's a uh, if it's an addiction of some sort, just remember, folks, just FYI, you're, you're never <laughs> you're always once an addict, always an addict. That's for sure. Thankfully, I never got into smack or anything like that. I don't know how those guys come over come back from getting involved in heroin and that kind of, I don't know how to do it. That just, it breaks my heart. These people, I just breaks my flipping heart, man. Ugh. Uh, savings will generate guaranteed income and in retirement. Does it make sense to transfer some of that tax deferred into deferred income annuities? Uh, uh, I, deferred, it, I'm not sure really where we're going with that. Uh, maybe, I, I, I don't know. I, there's too many variables in there. Sorry. Uh, if the Fed keeps raising rates, will that in turn raise all the annuity rates up? Also, yeah. Uh, oh, 66 days to form habit, says Darwin. Okay, right on. 66 days to form habit. Uh, the book back here says like 21 or something like that. I, I don't, I think 21 might be a little bit on the low end simply because, uh, um, it seems to me that one you, after 21 days, I don't, I don't, I'm not quite convinced you're quite there as a, has established a habit. So I'd be willing to say 66 days for sure. Uh, uh, to tr uh, JMS uh, keeps raising annuity rates. Yeah, it could. So uh, if the Fed rate, hey, the Fed's not raising rates at all anymore. Um, so the funny thing is, the Fed raised what they raised eight times last year, um, and yet here we are with a 10 year at 2.41. Um, I, I don't think the annuity rates, they don't jump at the same level of interest rates as a whole. Because remember, the annuities, as I said earlier today, are based on the portfolio the insurance companies and pensions already have. All right. So they have these pensions of long bonds that they bought many years ago. Uh, their average bonds in those pensions and insurance companies probably 15 years. Uh, and so for for them to raise rates or lower rates based on any current volatility, just it's just, you're not going to see it. Uh, now, it will happen in a gradual construct. I mean, if feds are raising, 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 the annuity rates will go up gradually to, to compensate, but it won't be it won't be uh, one for one, not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, yeah, Mark Orr is in the Atlanta area. He does fee based financial planning. Yeah, I actually. Um, MJ, I, I, I like Mark's book. Uh, actually, I, I like his book. The last chapter made me somewhat skeptical because he talked a lot about, I could tell he's going to go in the index annuity realm. And I, I just, I don't like those things. Now, look, I, I, I would have no problem. I actually invited Mark to be interviewed on my podcast and he didn't want to do it. He was nice. He was polite. He wasn't a bad guy. I just, and I like Mark. I liked his book was fast. His, his social security book was a, was, was wonderful. Let's put it that way. It's one of the top social security books I've ever read. I've read a bunch. Everyone should get Mark Orr's book. He's actually right here in Alpharetta, as a matter of fact. Um, the last chapter, just like, oh man, like the, the index. And he didn't, I can't remember. I just remember it's like, oh, that, that, it didn't ruin it for me, but just gave me the bad feeling. I was like, oh, why? So with that said, I would say uh, if you're going to hire Mark, and I, I don't know how he charges or anything like that, man, by all means do so. Just go in there with a skepticism towards index annuities because I, I could just, and that's my thinking. And, and look, I could be completely off base here. I don't know how he runs his practice. I like the guy. He's, he, he has more knowledge on Social Security and his middle, his middle finger, pinky finger, than all of us combined do. Uh, that's how much he knows about it for sure. And I know a lot and he knows more than I. So I'm, I'm a fan of his. I just be careful of, of uh, being solicited for an index annuity because they don't need it. Now, he might disagree and he might have a better presentation to put you in that. Hey, if that's what makes you sleep, now, I don't care. As long as you know, what, I don't care what you buy. As long as they disclose, this is what you get. But unfortunately, a lot of these insurance guys and investment guys, they don't disclose it. It drives me up the wall. Ha. Ah. Uh, Dave from Marlin. Yeah, I got a guy from Haddonfield. Now, a guy from Marlin. Right on, right on. I never watched the uneducated economy. Did I watch the uneducated economist? I think I have, Mike. I think I have. Uh, yeah, the best deferred income annuity is delaying uh, social care until 70. Yep, could not agree more. 
any word on the Social Security 2100? I, I, yeah, I have not. I actually, uh, um, I haven't heard anything. Did y'all go on to uh, Devin's? I put a thing on my YouTube channel to go on to Devin's. Uh, uh, he did a video on, I, man, to go on there and comment on it uh, because the more people who comment on it, uh, where was that? I forgot. But I uh, there's one of Devin's videos. I said, man, if more and more people comment on that, and, uh, and he's got the ear of a congressman. I imagine other people will be listening to the rabble that's out there, us, and say, hmm, maybe there's something here that we should be looking at because uh, uh, that, that's a good start. I mean, it'll, it'll never clear that 2100 the way that congressman proposes, but uh, and that's how you negotiate. You throw something out there and see where it goes. And I think it's a wonderful first step without question. Uh, what are your thoughts on Velocity Bank? And yeah, I don't know that much about it, John. Uh, I, I just don't know that much about Velocity Banking. I've, it, I've heard of it and, and somewhat makes sense to me, but I just haven't done enough research to pay much mind. So I'll have to pass on that. Uh, one follow up What is the maximum ratio you would put in at a guarantee? Uh, at TAI? Is that TIAA, guaranteed versus top market? Oh, yeah, I don't, man, I'll, <laughs> I, mean, I have no idea. Uh, what's the maximum uh, ratio? I don't know. I, I mean, literally, I, I, it's hard to say, man. Uh, I wrote my congressman center about 2100 right on. I would think, frankly, here's, and look, this ticks a lot of people off, but I'm just telling you, I think you should write Trump, the Trumpster, uh, because Trumpster, more than a stupid congressman or senator, and I get it, Senate is part of Congress, I get that. But Trumpster, he, he's got his ear more geared towards a certain kind of mindset of the American public than I think the average Democrat or average Republican does. And I, and I think because that if he got some uh, people that would uh, say, hey, man, we're not, you know, the Jeb Bushes of the world or the Hillary Clintons of the world. Uh, we're just regular working folk. I bet Trump would uh, would engage. And I guarantee Trump is desperate. For a bipartisan bill that he can take at the end of his first term. And I don't think this will ever be get done by the end of his first term, but I guarantee Trump is sitting there every day thinking about an infrastructure bill that he can get Chuck Schumer, Chuck and Nancy to, to co to co-sign for, with him. I guarantee that as one of his, you know, as a negotiator, he wants something that he can negotiate. And I guarantee, and I guarantee he's also more than willing uh, to take off uh, the corporatist base of his Republican Party. Uh, like the never Trumpers, the Bill Crystals of the world and whatnot, even more uh, with a more uh, what's the mainstream uh, Main Street uh, policy. I bet he would be. And I think it'd be interesting to see. So anyway, I would say maybe write the Trumpster. Uh, I had thought about doing that because I think there's a lot of people that uh, are middle of the road uh, who probably lean left, but see some value in various uh, thoughts that Trumpster can talk about. And I bet he could see something and secure that pretty easily uh, without a whole lot of effort, frankly. And I bet he would be willing to do it. Now, he would make a lot of Republicans mad in some degree, raising tax on Social Security and whatnot. Uh, but the vast majority of the Trump voters, um, you know, the, the, the wealthier are, are in the global, I mean, the, the elite in the global, the coastal areas. And they're not really voting for Trump anyway. And so uh, I think that would uh, be something to think about. Um, uh, have you ever... Can we let's see how bad people can we do that? I know my man Miles uh, remove. Yeah, let's just get you put hide that guy. Let's hide this guy. We got some drunk people on here. All right, so I'm gonna hide some of these guys. The barbecue in Georgia is all right, man. We have a place here. The uh, using this chin. Okay, cool. We got a place here. Uh, yeah, I'm getting all the drunks on here now. <laughs> Take your meds exactly. All right. Uh, <laughs> God, I love trolls. The barbecue is good. We got a place called, uh, uh, man, what was it? Uh, an Alfreda is good, man. Smoke jacks. Oh, their burnt ends are to die for. And then we got a place over here called Q right here in, uh, up on nine going towards, uh, that's an Alfreda as well. Man, smoke jacks. Oh man, I could eat that all day long. But it's not like Salt Lick in right out, you know, in the in the outside of Austin. I could go to Salt Lick and eat that all day long, man. That place was just oh. 
I miss that, man. Something wicked. When we were back in Texas, Monty, uh, I live up in your neck of the woods. I got a guy, uh, Monty from, uh, from North Texas. Uh, we're in, uh, we're staying in Frisco. Yeah. Fr Frisco. I think it was Frisco. We went to Rudy's a couple of times, but man, good stuff. All right. I think I'll just sign off here. It looks like the drunks are trying to take hold. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just stay off the roads, my friends. If you're the guy that's drinking on here, man, you don't want to be drinking and driving. Not worth it. We had a car accident just up the way here. I guarantee the guy was flying around a, a turn. Uh, and uh, I, I I don't know, uh, just today. And I guarantee, I don't know if he's drunk, but it, it took a turn too quick. Roads are wet, dark, dark night, and uh, not good. And uh, hit a tree head on. And I imagine uh, he's, he probably survived because I didn't see any, you know, jaws of life or anything but uh don't be drinking driving man uh because if you're killing yourself that's one thing but if you're gonna kill my kids or something like that because of your negligence that's bad and trust me if you go to as many aa meetings as i had and you listen to some of these guys and their stories it's sad man and they can never get it back don't be let that be you uh uh yeah chowder man don't worry about recession i'm telling you recessions happen all the time all the time. It's just, I'm telling you, go to Graham uh, Stepham's video he did today. On it, the, it was great. I mean, I talk about recessions, but he does his videos a little bit more um, in terms of. I just say, you know, I'll give you a couple of things to chomp on, but he goes a deep dive into his thing on a recession. He'll show you exactly, exactly the recession that happened here. What happened to the stock market? And you'll be like, oh, that's it. I'm just telling you, man. So I did one a few weeks back. Where the economist predicted 17 of the last four recessions is my standing joke against economists. And so what happens here is they say, oh, there's a recession. Okay, well, the, when we had this, uh, what's the uh, inverted yield curve? Well, the recession didn't happen until, you know, five months later or even like a year later. I mean, so it's kind of like saying, as I said, uh, kind of facetiously, if you eat carrots, you will die. I guarantee if you eat carrots, you will die. It's like these economists saying, there's an inverted yield curve. There will be a recession. Well, it's like me saying, you ate carrots, there's going to be a recession. I mean, because recessions happen all the time. It's part of the capitalistic society of a business cycle. The only way to get rid of recessions is to go socialistic, and then we're all poor. We're all equally poor, and we don't want that. So don't sweat it, brother. You'll be all, you'll be all good. All right, man. We'll, uh, we're going to take off for the night. See you guys. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. We'll see you later.